stuff that is happening in our world. So, all right, so we're going to talk about the seven secrets of Sabbath rest. And uh, let's talk with the Lord of the Sabbath for a moment, and then we will get underway. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing of the Sabbath. We thank you for the way you've given us this, this cathedral in time, that whether we are rich or poor, whether we are from whatever continent we're from, um, no matter what our educational background or the car we drive, we all have 24 hours of Sabbath rest. And so, Father, we, we thank you for this blessing, and I ask that we will truly be Sabbath keepers and receive the blessings of the Sabbath and be channel of those blessings to those around. So thank you, Father, for blessing us now with the presence of your Spirit to guide these thoughts and to um, stir our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And if I may ask you um, an honest question, do you look forward to Friday night more or Sabbath, Sabbath night more? Friday night. Friday night. You see, um, Sabbath keepers look forward to Friday night and Saturday keepers look forward to Sabbath night. And there is a difference. <clears throat> and uh, guarding the edges of the Sabbath... Um, it may apply to the Friday night in particular, but if you're, if you're not so much guarding the edges of the Sabbath on Saturday night, uh, the chances are you're a Saturday keeper. And so we're going to talk about seven, seven secrets of Sabbath rest. And the first of this is the one that we're all familiar with. And here we find it, um, the verb first word is in Genesis 2 and verse 2. And um, if you want to, you can open your Bibles and read with me, it's on the screen. It says, and on the seventh day God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. And that's the, that's the verse there. And the verb there is to Shabbat, and that's, the, that's where we get the word Sabbath from, Shabbat. Sabbath, and so the, the the most commonly known words or verb. It's actually it's not so much a, a noun as a verb. He shabbated on the Sabbath. It meant that God rested on the seventh day, and that's how it's translated in most English versions. And I've given you, if you want to take these slides down for yourself, you can study it out for yourself. There's the Strong's Concordance number seven six seven three. If you look it up in your Strong's Concordance, it will give you some more understanding of the depth of this word here, Shabbat. Now, the verb Shabbat includes the concept of being physically still and of having physical rest. And I don't know how you feel about Sabbath, um, but um, I often find that, well, when I was in my 20s, um, I, I would look forward to the weekend because I lived in the south of England and I'd uh, go on a ferry on Friday morning after my college classes and I'd get the ferry to northern France, and I'd go cycling around northern France, Brittany or, Sher or, or a Brittany area or Normandy, and I'd come back late Sunday night and be in classes again Monday morning. And I looked forward to the weekend because um, I had a lot of energy. And when I was uh, studying in Birmingham for my uh, undergraduate business degree, um, I used to cycle to church every morning. It wasn't because I had a moral objection to paying for the train, it was just that church, we started a church plant in a city 30 miles away uh, with a bunch of other students, and we cycled each way 30 miles to church and back. And uh, we, ha we were just oozing with energy, you know, we, we just couldn't wait to get out of bed. Uh, some of you are smiling, some of you remember those dim and distant days, yes. And uh, by the time I hit my 30s, I started looking forward to Friday night, not so much because I had this surge of energy at the weekend, but because um, I was tired and I was working. And then in my 40s, where I still am now, in my early 40s, I was starting looking forward to, um, to, my, uh, to Thursday night, because Thursday night is, is, is just before Friday arrives, and Friday I can kind of glide into the Sabbath. And in my, the second half of the 40s, I look forward to Tuesday night now, because Tuesday night is exactly halfway between Sabbath mornings. And that's the highlight of the week, the, the crown of the week. So I look forward to Tuesday night. By the time I hit my 50s, I'll be looking forward to last Friday. So uh, it's just a sign of, of you know, a, the fatigue that, that builds up in life. But um, the verb Shabbat um, includes the idea of physical rest or being still. And, you know, lay activities means different things for different people on Sabbath afternoon, doesn't it? Uh, for some people, that one hour of sleep on Sabbath afternoon is the most precious sleep you get in the whole week. Now, I don't often get a Sabbath afternoon sleep like once a quarter, but if I do, it's the best sleep I ever have. Um, so there is a place for rest in the Sabbath. We are not God's beasts of burden. We're his delight. And so it is not a sin to rest. Um, you might say it is sinful 
to abuse your body by working 24-7 and never actually stopping. God never intended that for us. Set six days shalt thou work and do all thy labor, saith the commandment. But the seventh day is the Shabbat to the Lord thy God. Now, um, in, the, in the ancient Middle East, um, the view was that humans were created by the gods to be the slaves of the gods so that the, so that the gods could rest. That was kind of the prevailing idea in Egyptian mythology, in Babylonian mythology, in Canaanite mythology. Uh, the idea was that the gods, whether it was Zeus or whether it was Ra or whether it was Bel, uh, from the various uh, parts of the Middle East, the gods created humans so humans could work in order that the gods could rest. But the, the, what we find in, in Genesis' account is that God creates in order that we might rest. Amen. And he gives us uh, this, this, this rest and it really is a beautiful thing, uh, the, the concept of rest, because um, we, we say in America, like a dollar a day, you've got to work for your daily bread and so forth. But according to the, the principle of the Sabbath, we work six days, but God gives us seven days of, of life. And so our life exists by the grace of God, not by the strength of our hands. Life is a gift, and the Sabbath day is a reminder that that even though we do our best, ultimately life is a gift from God, and we, we, receive, it, um, we receive it with gratitude. God creates humans, uh, humankind, and he rests on the Sabbath that we might have regular fellowship with mankind. And so God invites us to rest on the Sabbath. One of the reasons is so that we can reconnect with him, because often in the busyness of life, um, we, t we can cut back on our devotions. We may have a four o'clock, uh, three o'clock flight to get to uh, some days. You know, last Friday I flew at um, six o'clock from, from Chicago to Loma Linda, and I had to get up at one o'clock to get to, to O'Hare. And then um, I spoke for seven hours on Sabbath, and then, on, uh, and then in the evening another appointment, and Sunday morning I had a 5.15 flight to get back to Chicago. So I left at uh, 3 in the morning to get to my airport, and then I had a 7 o'clock flight on Monday to get here, so I was up at 1 o'clock again on Monday. So when you have that kind of life, you have to be very intentional about finding devotional time, and you need rest, okay? And so God gives us rest that we might have regular communion with Him. So may I ask you, know, how, do you how do you experience that dimension of the Sabbath for yourself? Do you experience physical rest? You know, if you're a pastor, if you're a preacher like Brother Eric here, you don't get much rest often on the Sabbath. It's a day of high labor, yes? And, you know, I, I'm an introvert. I'm not an extrovert. And so I, when, I, when I finish preaching, I'm like a stunned ox on Sabbath, you know? Uh, I like to go back and sit in my office on Sunday if I'm there, my home office, and I look at the, I have a blank wall that's kind of like white to color. I just like look at the wall. It's really calming for my soul. And uh, those of you who are introverts know what I'm talking about. I didn't mind the lockdowns at all. I was quite happy with the lockdowns. Um, so, um, but when you preach, um, you feel kind of like a spent bullet till about Tuesday. You have really no emotional and spiritual energy because it's so exhausting. And so may I ask you, how do you experience this dimension of the Sabbath for yourselves? And how may you better experience the physical rest that God wants you to have during the Sabbath day? And I'd encourage you to to carve out time for physical rest during the Sabbath day. Now, some people may physically rest by going for a walk in nature. Nature is God's second book. It reveals his character to us. It's peaceful. Uh, the grass is green. The trees are green, which is the most relaxing color for the brain to just physically see. And so God has engineered this world to be a relaxing place for us, not in the city, but in the countryside. And so I would encourage you to be intentional about gaining physical rest during the Sabbath hours. And if you're full of energy and you know someone who is maybe lacking in energy, uh, you know, my wife, when we were raising two small kids, I would take the kids out sometimes on a Sabbath afternoon for a walk so my wife could rest. And uh, when you're, you know, feeding kids at night, rest becomes really important. Uh, I've noticed that men, uh, we have this, God gave us a, maybe, a, I'm not sure if it's a defect in the ears, but I noticed that, I, in my experience, many guys have that it's a tragic experience. Um, we can sleep at night with a screaming toddler two feet from our ears and we don't hear it. It just doesn't enter our ears. Does anybody else have that experience? Yeah, and I wake up in the morning and I say, boy, David slept well last night. And my wife says, oh, no, he didn't. I was up four times last night. So, um, so, yeah, so guys find it easy to get rest in that sense. So how can you help somebody else have that kind of rest for themselves? Think about it. 
There may be somebody in your church who's a 24-7 carer. They may need a break. There may be somebody in your church who's raising small kids or who has um, a child with a developmental disorder. They may need a break. So think about not only how you can gain physical blessing rest for yourself, but ask yourself, how can I help somebody else to have a rest during the Sabbath day so they know that they can get a break? And if somebody is a carer 24-7, maybe, uh, maybe an elder, a lady, her husband has got Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease they, disease, they may just need a break. And the Sabbath hours are a great opportunity to say, let me minister to you and let me give you a break for a couple of hours on the Sabbath afternoon. Now, the second of the seven verbs is nuach. We find that in Exodus 20, verse 11. Now, in the English, it just says rested. So it's, you can't tell this in the English language. Uh, this is why it's helpful to study the Hebrew and the Greek. But in Exodus 20, 11, it says, For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, but he rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. And this, this verb, nuach, can you think of a Bible character whose name goes along with this? Noah. Noah. All right, so it, it means something to do with rest. All right. So Deuteronomy 5, 14 uses this verb as well. We read there, But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do no work, thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that was in thy gates, that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. And so we find it, um, you know, Exodus 20 has the fourth commandment, but Deuteronomy 5 also has the, has the Ten Commandments, but the Sabbath commandments in Deuteronomy 5 is different to the Sabbath commandments in Exodus 20. Exodus 20, we rest on the seventh day, we honor the Sabbath because God created the world in six days. And in, in Deuteronomy 5, we rest on the Sabbath day because God delivered us from slavery to sin. And so, um, why is this verb different? Well, the verb is not Shabbat, it is Nuach. It means to rest, but it includes the concepts of tranquility, mental repose, mental intellectual rest, and it's the origin of the name Noah. And so the Sabbath is the promise of intellectual and mental rest in the midst of the storms of life. It's a time when you can stop thinking about that business that's not doing so well. It's a time when you can legitimately say, I'm not going to study for my final university exams on the Sabbath day. I'm not going to be driven by worry on the seventh day. I may worry about all kinds of things during the week, but in the Sabbath, God asks me to experience nuach rest, that is, mental and intellectual rest, that in the storms of life, I can find peace because I'm trusting in my Heavenly Father. And the key issue there is Noah found rest not because he was in the ark, but because he trusted in the God who instructed him to build the ark. And uh, to give you an example in our lives, I used to fly a lot in the former Soviet Union, and I uh, used to fly on airlines that were really distinctly dodgy. They had really terrible safety records. Uh, you know, one of them, uh, Zeri Airlines called Azal, their theme tune was Nearer My God to Thee, or at least it was in my opinion, <laughs> because things kept going wrong on those planes. You know, we, the aircraft decompressed once uh, as we were coming into land, and Everybody kind of included myself, we passed out on the plane, and then the, plane, the pilot dived, and then we kind of came to lower altitude, and we came to again, and that wasn't a nice experience. And uh, we were coming in slammed another time, and the landing gear wouldn't come down. And so we were circling while the pilot is an old Tupolev. Nothing is electronic on those planes, it's all mechanical. The engineer was, uh, you know, grinding down the wheels. And uh, we were in the midst of a war zone. There was Iran and Armenia and Turkey, and we were just circling like a small plane to avoid going into other people's airspace while we were grinding down the wheels. And another time we were coming into land, and they realized just as they were landing that there was a snowplow left on the runway. So we touched down and took straight off again. So it, these were near death experiences, you might say. And I always used to pray really hard when I get on those Azal flights. But we had our small son with us, David, and we carried him in his car seat on the plane, and we noticed that he was always sleeping perfectly happily on the plane. Why? Because he was with his mum and his dad. And when you know that you have a heavenly father who watches over you, and he knows when a sparrow falls to the ground, and he knows the hairs on your head, and he has plans for your life, and your eternal future is secure, you can experience the Nuach rest on the Sabbath. So I want to challenge you today, you know, how might you 
Uh, so God invites humans to rest on the Sabbath. It's a rest for the intellect, a rest for the mind, a rest that where we may find inner peace amidst the storms of life. And, you know, America is going through storms today, is it not? Our society is going through storms. Maybe your house, is, your family is going through a storm right now. So uh, how do we experience this dimension of the Sabbath for ourselves? Just a question for you to reflect on. How might you experience the Nuach rest on the Sabbath that God intends for you? And how may you better experience this dimension of the Sabbath for yourself? And how may you share this dimension of the Sabbath with somebody else? Uh, offering them comfort on the Sabbath day. Uh, maybe saying, I know you have a problem. Maybe I can help take care of it for you. Um, that gives someone incredible rest. You know, if, if you're a single mother, um, you generally have much less margin than a married couple in life. Margin financially, margin in terms of time, and so forth. And if you're a single mother raising a couple of kids and the washing machine goes out, okay, you generally don't have the finances or the time or the know-how to fix it, and that causes you stress. But to go to church and to say, my washing machine broke, and have to, some, have, have, to have somebody say, hey, I'll come by tomorrow and I'll fix it for you, that gives that single mother nuach rest gives her peace of mind that this problem is taken care of, okay? So we can all contribute to the Nuach rest for those who are going through the storms of life. Now the third of the seven verbs relating to the Sabbath is nafash, Strong's 5314. Exodus 31, 17 talks about the Sabbath this way, it says, it is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And so uh, the Sabbath involves physical rest, um, that's like taking time out. It also involves intellectual and mental rest in the midst of the storms, uh, but it also involves the concept of being refreshed. And so this verb nafash, what does it mean? It be means to be refreshed, to take on new life, and to take on new vitality. And this verb is re repeated in Exodus 23, 12, that says, Six days shalt thou do thy work, and on the seventh day thou shalt rest that your ox and, and your ass may rest, and the son of your handmaid and the stranger may be refreshed. And so what, what, what um, sense does this verb bring to us? Well, this verb catches the sense that God wishes us to have not just physical rest, which is Shabbat, but also um, em um, emotional restoration during the Sabbath. It's not so much talking about physical refreshment as emotional refreshment. God is wishing to heal us emotionally during the Sabbath hours. This is in contrast with psychiatry. A psyche and hyatra in Greek means healing for the soul. So uh, the modern world may give you psychiatry and antidepressants, and God gives us the Sabbath day. And uh, he gives us the Sabbath day that we might be emotionally refreshed, and that we might be restored emotionally, that we might have fresh energy emotionally to take us through the coming week. Uh, some people, uh, they come to church and... Um, I used to pastor in large Jamaican churches in London, in the UK, and uh, I realized that for many people, the most important part of the worship was, was not the sermon, it was the praise time. And the praise time would go on for 45 minutes. And you wouldn't stand up to preach in some churches till one o'clock. You know, so you'd start out at like seven o'clock with prayer huddles, and then, you know, eight o'clock you've got like um, a witness seminar, and then nine o'clock you've got um, Sabbath school starts, and then 10 o'clock, 10.30, you've got like an emergency meeting in the vestry to do with a marriage in crisis. Then 11 o'clock, the Sabbath, the worship service starts, and you have praise, and, praise time for 45 minutes. Then you have testimony time for like 45 minutes, and you have the children's story for 25 minutes. And then you have an offering appeal, which takes 15 minutes, and you stand up to speak at 1 o'clock, and all the kids are like fast asleep in the church. But I'll tell you this. Um, uh, the, uh, it was the praise time that was most important to many, many people. Amen. Now, why is that? God the of his yes, yeah. And when we get to heaven, we're not going to hear sermons. We're going to be praising God. Amen. Because praise, uh, particularly praise, when we sing the praise of our Creator, um, praise, like any music, it reaches parts of our souls that mere words cannot. And so as I speak with you today, each of you has a mental filter up and you're evaluating every word that I say. But when you, when you have music, music bypasses those critical faculties. And so you ha when you hear, let's say, Handel's Messiah, um, it elicits a physiological response and you have no control over that physiological response. You know, the hairs may stand up on the back of your neck. You don't control that. 
And so your body is responding to that physiological response, um, but you're not telling it to. And so that's why, for instance, when Hollywood does a movie and they show it in Japan, they may show the subtitles on the bottom of the screen, but the, la but the music score does not change on the movie. The music is a universal language. And when we praise God, um, it actually lifts our souls. It lifts us out of the stress of today, and it reminds us that God is on his throne. So uh, many years ago, before I had gray hair, I was in my early 20s, I was running around Afghanistan, and um, we, we had a lot of fun and games. We were shot at, uh, staff were kidnapped. Um, yeah, it was, it was pretty stressful out there, and we never knew whether we'd come back alive or dead each day. And this was with ADRA, it wasn't with the military. And um, on those roads out there, I found myself singing songs of praise because songs of praise were the only way I could keep my sanity out there. And I was singing songs like, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Wide, wide is the ocean, high as the heavens above, deep, deep as the deeper sea is my Savior's love. And so um, the Sabbath is a time where God invites us to experience not just physical rest, that is Shabbat, um, not just um, intellectual rest, that is Nuach, in the midst of the storms of life, we can take time out, but it, God also invites us to experience emotional refreshment and renewal. And so I'd encourage you, you know, uh, when you come along for, for, for these uh, programs, participate in the singing. It's good for your soul. You know, lift your voices in praise to God. God will reach parts of your human experience and, and the needs of your heart through the praise time, probably more than through the sermons or the talks or the seminars themselves. So uh, the Sabbath is, next, is a time for us to experience emotional healing and restoration during the Sabbath. And you see those same kind of questions up there. Okay. Now the fourth verb that we find is asa. That's Strong's Concordance 6213. We find this in Exodus 31, 16. It says, Therefore the Israelites shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. So what does this verb mean? Um, it's actually the verb uh, to observe. It means to make. That is, you make a Sabbath. Like, you don't drift into the Sabbath. You make a Sabbath. Um, the, the, you, the Sabbath doesn't happen to you. You happen to the Sabbath, you might say. That um, you don't just work for six days a week and drop off a cliff into a state of physical collapse on the Sabbath. No. God's invitation for us is to make a Sabbath. Just like... Um, hopefully, if it's your wedding anniversary, guys, you're planning for that wedding anniversary. Okay, I'm not, I haven't always honored that myself. I, I've forgotten it, and uh, my wife never lets me forget that I've forgotten it. Um, I, I said to her last year, I said, you know, uh, twice in 19 or 20 years isn't a bad strike record, you know? You know, that's, that's, that you should look at it positively, that's 18 out of 20, I remembered. And she said, yes, but not on the year that you forgot. So, anyway, uh, we, we are invited by God to make a Sabbath. Now, you find this also, this verb, in Isaiah 58, which also talks about the Sabbath. It says, If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing or making thy pleasure on my holy day, etc., etc. So, what does this verb really mean? It means that we make Sabbath an oneg, that is, a delight. We find that in Isaiah 58:13 that um, this parallels the exquisite delight that we find in the marital relationship found in Song of Solomon. And so just as you would prepare for a wedding or for a marriage or for a, 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 a family, um, a family get-together, whether you prepare for Thanksgiving, whether you prepare for your wedding or for your ba um, baptism or for your um, birthday, so God invites us to make the Sabbath day, that we don't just drift into it. We don't just go into like um, neutral, um, uh, neutral um, what do you call it, gear on your vehicle. You don't just drift through the Sabbath day. God invites us to make the Sabbath day in order that it is a delight. And so he invites us to make the Sabbath a delight and not to be, um, not to be satisfied with the cheap thrills of daily business on the Sabbath, but to seek God's special delight on the Sabbath day. And that is maybe best expressed in, in loving service to those around us. You see some passages there that discuss that. Deuteronomy 5, 15, Isaiah 58, 6 to 8, and Matthew 12, 11, and John 5, 17. So we can make the Sabbath a delight um, by looking to serve those in need around us, by looking to be a blessing to those. And as we bless others, so God blesses us in turn. So um, we, we can make the Sabbath day. And again, I would challenge you to think about how you, how you experience the Sabbath day. Do you just drift into the Sabbath? Do you collapse into the Sabbath, exhausted? 
Um, or is the Sabbath kind of like, like dead time? Or is it the climax of the week for you? And is it a chance when you can experience delight outside of your normal run-of-the-mill activities during the week? So I want to challenge you today to think about making the Sabbath for yourself, making it a delight, and uh, to use the Song of Solomon imagery, just as you prepare for your wedding day and no detail is left, you know, you don't, you don't um, miss any details, uh, to make the Sabbath a delight for you and your family. You know, speaking as a pastor, I much prefer wedding uh, funerals to weddings. As kind of a side note, because at a funeral, nothing worse can go wrong. So, you know, if you get the wrong name up there, you know, it's not so big a deal. People don't listen so much when you're at a funeral. Um, you have to be careful, though, you know, because if he was abusive, you can't say things like he left his mark on everybody, you know. So, um, or we say we'll all remember him in our own unique way is a better way of saying that. But. Um, wed weddings these days are complex matters because you may have um, blended families with four mothers and stepmoms, and when they say who works, who walks first up the aisle, and they look at you, and you realise there's tension in the family, you have to look like who's the fiercest looking person here, and say well actually it's the stepmother who's married the father who generally in these circumstances has the right to walk up the aisle first. So uh, anyway, that's kind of a side note on marriages, but. Uh, the fifth verb is kalach. It's from Strong's, it's number 3615. And this is found back in Genesis 2 and verse 2. And earlier, the first verb we looked at was rested, Shabbat. But now we're looking at the word finished. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. Now, this verb kala, it means to complete, to finish, or to fulfill. And it has, it's from the same root as uh, the concept of consummation, kala, which is strong as 33618, three, which means a bride. So the Sabbath, therefore, contains bridal imagery. It represents the consummation of God's creation and the consummation of his relationship between God and his people. And so in the Sabbath hours, God is not just inviting us to rest physically, which is Shabbat. He's not just inviting us to experience mental rest in the midst of the storms of life. That's Noach. He's not just expecting, uh, inviting us to um, uh, achsa, the Sabbath, which is to make a Sabbath a delight. He's inviting us to experience intimacy with him that uh, we may not have time for him during the week or we may have like a passing relationship during the week but during the sabbath day is a chance for us to reset our walk with god on a weekly basis and it's a chance for us to reconnect with him and again uh if i may ask you this question um when was the last time you personally experienced god's grace like when was the last time you read about grace probably this week when was the last time you heard about grace in a sermon? Probably not so long ago. When was the last time you sung about grace? Maybe during this camp meeting. Those are all well and good, but when was the last time you experienced God's grace to you? When was the last time when you were overwhelmed with God's goodness to you in your life and your lack of um, claim on God, your lack of credit with God, your, your, your um, inability to demand anything from God, but you were just overwhelmed with God's goodness to you? Now think about it. Because if you've never experienced God's grace, how can you pass it on to somebody else? And the Sabbath is God's invitation for us to experience his grace once again. So again, um, different people experience God in different ways. Some people experience God through, through music. My, my father was a pastor and he loved listening to um, Elijah and Handel's Messiah. And he'd come back from church and he'd lie on the floor in the living room with his feet up on the couch. Not sure why he did that. And he'd put on Handel's Messiah on, on the LP player. And he listened to a couple of parts of Handel's Messiah. And that really ministered to his soul. Uh, other, people were, the other people want to go out and look at the night sky with a, with a, with a telescope. And they'll look out and uh, they, they, are, they consider the stars and they wonder that how it is that God is mindful of humanity. Other people, they experience God through um, listening to, um, you know, audioverse or sermons on audioverse. Other people experience God by being within a, a small prayer group and having that spiritual support and accountability and people speaking God's truths into your life. You may say, oh, my life is an absolute mess and your brother or sister next to you might say, well, actually, this is what God has done in your life and this is what we see God doing in your life and this is what God is doing in your life and it reminds you that God is active in your life in a very profound way. And so we all experience God in different ways. We don't all experience God in the same way. 
So as you enter the Sabbath hours, ask yourself, how am I most open to God? And do that during the Sabbath hours. If you're most open to God through the hearing of praise, you know, welcome the Sabbath with, 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 with some praise music, um, some choral music. Um, if you're most open to, to the Word of God, to God through His Word, spend time studying the Word of God. Not an informational reading, but a transformational reading of Scripture. Uh, we're really good at reading the Bible for information. Um, you know, if you've got a sermon to prepare, you read it for information. If you've got a Bible study to prepare, you read it for information. If you want to prove your brother wrong next week because you've been arguing about a certain point in Sabbath school, you're going to read the Bible to pick up some weapons to hit him with next Sabbath, aren't you? You're reading the Bible for informational reading, but that is not a transformational reading of Scripture. Uh, and an informational reading of Scripture is where we read the Bible so that we master the text. A transformational reading is where we read the Bible in order that God might master us. And that God masters us through the text and we read the Bible, not so that we read the Bible, but we read the Bible in order to meet he who gave us the word of God, which is our Heavenly Father. And so it's a very, very different way of reading the word of God um, than re an, uh, an informational reading of the scriptures. Uh, to give you an example of that, um, if you take an, a story of Jesus, um, let, oh, let's say the woman caught in adultery as, as a random example, you could, you could pick any of the stories of Jesus. Um, a, a, an, uh, an informational, a transformational reading of Scripture would be something like this. Um, there are many characters in that story. So there's the woman caught in adultery, there's the people, her accusers, there's Jesus, and there are the disciples, and there's the crowds. There's at least five groups implied within that story. Go through that story verse by verse, asking yourself, what was my chosen character's spiritual experience in every verse of that story? So let's talk about the woman caught in adultery from her perspective as a transformational reading of scripture you do this in your morning devotions and you have five senses yes most of us have got five senses and um, so what does she hear initially well she hears seductive words and she hears lying words and then she hears angry words and she tastes um, the, the, the thrill of illicit love then she tastes bitterness and anger and then she feels shame. And then she hears voices calling for her to die. And she hears the shock of the crowd. And she thinks, am I going to die? And then she hears silence and somebody scratching in the ground. And then she hears the voice of Jesus. And the last words she hears are, uh, go in peace, neither do I condemn thee. Go, go in peace and sin no more, but I do not condemn you. What lesson is that for me today? Well, I may live in a world where I hear many accusing voices. I may have bitterness in my life. I may have been lied to. I may have been trapped. But at the end of the day, it's Jesus has the final say in my life as well. And so I'm going to listen for his voice for today. That's more of a transformational reading of Scripture. So you, any of us can do that. Uh, just follow the stories of Jesus. They're great examples. And you could do that tomorrow from the perspective of the, of the angry crowd. The day after that, the perspective of the Sadducees what is, or the, the disciples, what is their spiritual experience in every step of the way. It's where you use, as Sister White says in um, Thoughts and Man's Blessings, page one, your sanctified imagination. Let us go back to the imagine the scene with our sanctified imagination to the thoughts from Mount of Blessing as she describes it there. So in the verb kala, God invites us to experience intimacy with him. And so I would invite you or challenge you today to um, be very intentional about you how you experience the Sabbath hours. How do you experience God in the most personal way? Plan on doing that sometime during the Sabbath hours. Set aside time for that. Now, I have a cousin who enjoys water painting. You know, he's gone through a lot of troubles in his life, um, really some profound pain in his life, and he finds peace by water painting. And he goes to the beach on Sabbath afternoons and he does a watercolor of just the beach and the birds flying overhead. And that brings peace to his soul. All right, and so that may not be a traditional way of spending the Sabbath, but it is how he reconnects with God because he's on his own, he's in nature, and he's appreciating, he's studying the nature and the, the, the light on the water and so forth and, and how the birds fly, etc., etc. So we can all set aside and be intentional time in the Sabbath for how we experience God at the most personal level. The next verb that we find, the verb six that we find uh, in the... Um, is uh, blessed. 
And we're familiar with this Barak, uh, Barack Obama. Baraka in Arabic means blessing. Uh, so God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. You've got Shabbat there, we've already covered. And now this is blessed. And uh, the verb of Barak, it means to bless, to empower. It implies the gift of being bountiful and the gift of multiplication. So we also read this passage, this verb, in, uh, we find the parallel to this in Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27, which says, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols, I will cleanse you. A new heart also I will give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments, and you shall do them. It's a beautiful promise from God that is tied to the Sabbath day. And so God, uh, this verb here, Barak, it means he empowers his people through the infilling of the Holy Spirit and the provision of the new heart experience to bring new hearts and to bring a new heart and therefore new lives to those who love God. And God wishes us to have that empowering and infilling experience of the Holy Spirit throughout the week, but particularly during the Sabbath day. So this is a, a beautiful promise from God. When God blessed the Sabbath day, he's promising the gift of the Holy Spirit, uh, particularly during the Sabbath day. And that brings a blessing to us. Uh, it takes away the works of the flesh and it brings us the fruit of the Spirit. We start to see a character transformation within our lives. And so we might say with uh, John Newton that I'm not the man or woman that I want to be, but by God's grace, neither am I the man or woman that I used to be. And so when we go through the Sabbath day, we're asking God to be different people at the end of the Sabbath to those who got up in the morning. We're wanting to grow. We're wanting to mature. We want to put on Christ, as we're reading at the end of uh, Colossians 3. Or uh, we want to be the new man in Christ. We want to be more of the new creation. So as we go through the Sabbath hours, as you go through your Sabbath hours, um, again, it's not just about having physical rest. It's about asking God to transform us with the infilling of his Holy Spirit. It being intentional about this. Recognizing that I may have a problem with anger. I may have a problem with bitterness. I may have a problem with short-temperedness. I may have a problem with lust. I may have a problem with fear. Many ladies are particularly crippled by fear, it seems to me. Many men suffer from pride, but women suffer from fear but among all the emotions. That's at least my experience. And asking God to transform and to take away the works of the flesh and, my, and to uh, change some of my fallen nature more so it reflects the character of Jesus. So uh, the Barak promise, Barakah, um, is the promise that God um, will give us the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and he will transform our characters. The seventh of the seven verbs is Kadash, Strong 6942, Genesis 2-3. So God blessed, that's Barak, the seventh day, and he hallowed it. And of course, rested there is Shabbat. He hallowed it. And uh, because on it God rested from all the work that he'd done in creation. So what does this mean? Well, uh, kad uh, Kadash, we get uh, uh, Kadosh, holy in Hebrew. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We see that throughout the Psalms. And so God hallowed the Sabbath. That means he makes it holy. He sanctifies it. He purifies it. And he dedicates it. And God makes something holy through his holy presence. Now, um, we tend to think of our churches as being holy. You know, we consecrate our churches, and in the visible church, which we have in America, um, church revolves around the church building, and it revolves around the pulpit, and, and the pastors or the elders, they preach, and they, and, they, and they feed the congregation, and we have this idea in our minds that, that the, the, the church building is holy, and, nothing, and everything else is secular in our lives, but in the underground church, the opposite is true. In the underground church, uh, the, the spiritual life does not revolve around the pulpit in a visible church because there is no longer a pulpit in a visible church. What there is is house churches and families gathering for worship every day. And when, so when in, in, the, in the underground church, it's not that you have a, a consecrated church for worship, but your home is consecrated for the worship of God. Your home is consecrated for the study of the Word of God. And rather than the pastors feeding the sheep, um, uh, in the underground church, um, the, the sheep are feeding themselves. All right? And so God hallows the Sabbath through his holy presence. And in that sense, you may experience the holiness of the Sabbath in a prison cell, in a campsite, as well as in a church building itself. 
And so we ask, to, as we enter the Sabbath hours tomorrow night, we all ask uh, for God to bless us, particularly with the presence of his Holy Spirit, and to sanctify everything that happens uh, on this campsite. Now, the modern meaning of rest is that we rest... Uh, the modern understanding of rest, as it relates to this verb, is that we rest so that we can get on to the most important thing of life, which is work. Yes? Anybody here a workaholic? Yeah, come on, raise your hands. Confess if you're a workaholic. Yes, we have a few. Uh, I, I love work, okay? I, I get up and I love work. And I, I hate taking vacation, even though I get instructed to take it. Uh, the AFM board like, has to tell me that like, you need to take a week off and don't do any email and don't do anything. So during the lockdowns, you know, you work from home, and when you're on vacation, you work from home, all right? Nothing really changes. Uh, I, I love work because I love seeing souls saved, and, and it's just a privilege. And so to me, it's not work, it's a joy to get up every morning and to, le to labor for the Lord. But uh, workaholism is, is not good for you, really. And the biblical understanding of the Sabbath is the week is something we get through to in order to get to the climax of living, which is not work, but the climax of living is the Sabbath. And the Sabbath is a cathedral in time that is equally available to all people of all nations in every part of the world today. The material creation, days one through six of the creation story, was capped by a spiritual creation, that is the Sabbath. You have the creation of the world and universe in six days, but the, 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 the capstone of creation is the Sabbath itself. And if you live a life that is focused exclusively on the material, that means you're living in days one, one through six of the creation, you're missing out on the ultimate blessing of God's creation, which is holy time, that cathedral and time that God has given to us. And so people who live in the material world, who tend to be workaholics, um, who just live for material gain, and as Madonna sang, I'm a material girl living in a material world, very famous song from the mid-80s, um, that kind of um, outlook on life um, is ultimately an unfulfilled outlook, an experience of life. You're not going to find full satisfaction and full peace in your life if you just live in the material world. The Sabbath is, is, is a spiritual dimension in creation, and God has given it equally to all people. So no matter what your material experience of life may be, whether you're rich or poor, whether you live in a palace or whether you're in a refugee camp, we all can experience the Sabbath hours. That is God's blessing for all of his children. And so and the first uh, complete day experienced by humanity was the Sabbath. That's interesting that, yes? God did not create Adam and Eve on a Sunday and say, off you go to work and I'll see you in six days' time. You know, the first day that they experienced, the norm as far as they, was con they were concerned was their communion with God on the Sabbath day. And maybe they then got a shock on the Sunday where we said, now off you go and you, you got six days to work in the garden. Uh, when, when my daughter, we, when we applied for our green cards, um, when you get your green card, it's a long drawn out process over many years and uh, you live with a lot of uncertainty during that time. And when you, when you apply for the green card, you get your I-360, which is permission to transition from whatever visa you're on to apply to the, three, to the, um, to the green card, a permanent residency. But when you apply for permanent residency, um, one of the first things they give you is a travel parole that allows you to travel outside the States for an emergency. And the next thing they give you is like a little um, uh, driver's license. And it's a federal authorization to work card, okay? Now, if you come here as a pastor to America, you come on an R1 visa, that's a religious worker's visa, and you're tied to the conference that asked you to work for them. You can't move to anybody else. But your spouse and your children have R2 visas, which are dependent visas, and they're not allowed to work under any way. They can volunteer, but they can't work until you get your green card. And so the, the R1 visa process, you know, you can be here for five years on an R1 and it can take you three or four more years after that to get a, a green card. So you can be potentially in the States for up to 10 years where you're working but your spouse and your children cannot work. That means that your children pay foreigner rates for college tuition and not American rates. I mean, there are many implications of these rules in immigration. And my little girl was four when she got from Uncle Sam a, a letter in the mail like a driver's license with her name on it and her picture, says that you are now authorized to work. <laughs> and so we showed this to her, and at supper time that night, we said, now, Christina, Uncle Sam has authorized you to work, which really is a requirement to work, and you need to do the dishes tonight. And 
what had was originally in the morning in the mail a blessing oh good I can now work you know I, we can now go to McDonald's and say I know that the law says she can't work till she's 14 or so at McDonald's but she has a special card from the US president that says she can now work at McDonald's at the age of four well what originally was intended to be a blessing an authorization to work it showed you're making progress to the green card turned in my daughter's mind to a curse mummy and daddy were now requiring her to dust the house on Friday night and to you know, uh, you know, start wiping the dishes and so forth. And so, uh, if we're not careful, um, the Sabbath it likewise can become a burden for us. But that which God intended to be a delight, we can turn into a burden or a blessing for ourselves. So in Hebrews four, we find the concept of rest in Jesus Christ. And just as Adam and Eve were invited to rest in the completed work of creation at the end of the creation week, so we're invited to rest in God's completed work of recreation, in the salvation that God wrought for us on Calvary, and we are invited to finish and rest in God's finished work, that is, his work of creation and, and salvation. Therefore, the Sabbath is not an interlude, a break before you get on with the important work of life. The Sabbath is the climax of living where we step aside from a world of work and a world of worry, and we step into a world of wonder. And so the Sabbath really is the climax of living. So there are seven verbs we've just gone through here. And uh, so the Sabbath truth, and we're going to touch on what Sister White says about this here, the Sabbath truth is not merely a question about the right day. It's not merely a question about is it Saturday or Sunday. I mean, that is an important question, I get it, but... Um, if you say we keep the seventh day Saturday as the Sabbath, but it's a burden for you, it's hardly a way of winning, winning people to Jesus Christ, is it? Amen. So there are seven verbs we've just looked at in the Old Testament that talk about the profound blessing that God intends for all people through the Sabbath day. Sister White talks about in early writing. She says this, page 33. I saw that God had children who do not see and keep the Sabbath. They have not rejected the light upon it, and at the commencement of the time of trouble, we were filled with the Holy Ghost as we went forth and proclaimed the Sabbath more fully. So what does it mean to proclaim the Sabbath more fully? It means that the Sabbath is not just you go to church on the Saturday. That's not the proclamation of the Sabbath that God wishes for us to share with our neighbors. The proclamation of the Sabbath is that God wants us to make it a delight. It is like the high day of the week. It's like having a weekly birthday. It's a time for physical rest. It's a time for emotional refreshment. It's a time for, um, for um, serving others. It's a time to experience intimacy with God. And it's a time to receive the, infl the infilling of the Holy Spirit. There are many blessings that God wants us to share with others about the Sabbath day. The Sabbath truth includes a positive proclamation that it's not just you don't worship on Sunday, but the proclamation of the Sabbath is a reminder that God wants us to experience the Sabbath as the climax of living. And for outreach person purposes, it's not helpful to proclaim the Sabbath primarily in terms of negative prohibitions like I don't work on the Sabbath, I don't go to the ball game on the Sabbath, I don't watch the high school ball games on Friday nights. That's not the best way to talk about the Sabbath because it's not going to win anybody. But talking about the blessings that God has for you in the Sabbath is a much more winsome way of sharing the truth about the Sabbath. The proclamation of the Sabbath truth, I believe, is to be in positive terms, emphasizing God's promised blessings and the positive spiritual values of those who honor the Sabbath. So just as the Sabbath was the crowning act of creation, so I believe that the Sabbath is one of the crowning jewels of our spiritual life and of witnessing and outreach in our community so that people can experience a delight during the Sabbath day. And, uh, you know, in America today, um, maybe the dominant emotions are fear and anger. Uh, those are kind of the dominant emotions in, in public life. You see it all across our nation. And uh, fear and anger, they get, they get tired after a while. It's, it's hard to live with ongoing anger, and it's very hard to live with perpetual fear. And so it's our privilege as Seventh-day Adventists to proclaim the truths about the Sabbath and the blessings about the Sabbath, not just you keep the seventh day, but these are the blessings that God has for us in store, has in store for us as we honor the Sabbath day and we plan for our Sabbath day and we make a Sabbath day and we make the Sabbath the climax of the week and we realize that we are not human doings, but we are human beings. We are not human doings, we are human beings. And to be a human, uh, if you are locked in solitary confinement for 10 years, that does not make you less a human being. So the absence of work uh, does not demean you as a human being. You lose a blessing, but it's, it doesn't intrinsically change who you are. 
Um, we are human beings, not human doings, created for communion with our Heavenly Father and for loving service to those around us. So I want to challenge you today, to, as you live your lives here in Northern Maine, to think about how you keep the Sabbath, how you share the truth about the Sabbath, and to be intentional about you, or how you, in your churches, in your uh, fellowship groups, how you keep the Sabbath, so that other people, they may want to also taste and see that God is good, as we read there in the Psalms. So those are just some thoughts on the Sabbath, and it's 10.21. We've got time to move on to fasting. You okay with moving on to fasting now? Yes? Yeah? All right. So we'll move on to the topic of fasting, and uh, fasting is a... Uh, is a fascinating topic, and um, we're gonna we're gonna talk about the whys and the hows and the wherefores of fasting up here. Um, fasting is something Jesus assumes that we will fast. Okay, Jesus assumes in Matthew six, he says, whenever you pray, whenever you fast, and whenever you give to the poor, he says, don't do as the Pharisees do, but this is how I want you to do it. So if you are a disciple of Jesus today, Jesus assumes that you fast, that you pray, and that you give to the poor. Those are like the uh, the, the the essential. Uh, th those are intrinsic components of the Christian experience for us today. Now, there's a beautiful promise in Second Chronicles 7:14. Many of us are familiar with this promise. It says, "If my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land." Isn't that a beautiful promise? Now, that phrase "to humble yourself" is is another way of saying if they will fast. So if, uh, if heart fasting is an expression of humility before God. And uh, all right, so um, where am I getting this from? All right, why don't you open your Bibles? I want to make sure I've got the, um, the right text here. Isaiah 58. I think this is where we're coming from here. Yeah. So in Isaiah 58, God is talking to Israel about, to Judah about the Sabbath and how they're not keeping it properly. And he's talking about true worship. And uh, if you look at Isaiah 58, verse 3, uh, then God says to the people of Judah, he says, uh, they, they say, why do we fast, but you do not see? Why do we humble ourselves, but you do not notice? So God's people were literally fasting but God wasn't noticing. They were humbling themselves before God, but God did not see this. And God says to them, look, you serve your own interests on your fast day and you oppress all your workers. You fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fix, fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. And then Isaiah goes from verse 5 through to verse 9 through different aspects of fasting, um, different uh, spiritual ble blessings of fasting that apply to us today. And so um, we're going to pick it up here in verse 6. Uh, Isaiah says this, <clears throat> Is not this the fast that I choose? This is God speaking through Isaiah. To loose the bands of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. And I want to focus on that expression, to let the oppressed go free. Um, this ties into Matthew 17, 21, where Jesus says that this type, of, this type of demon only comes out through fasting and prayer. And so one of the reasons that we fast is to is to um, loose the bands of wickedness, to set us free from the oppression of Satan. And why do we do that? We do that because, um, you know, when you fast, you, faint, you feel physically weak. When you feel physically weak, you have a, a renewed sense of dependence upon God. When you have a renewed sense of dependence upon God and God answers your prayers, um, you are more likely to give God the, the praise and the honor and the glory rather than say that I did it in my own strength. And so fasting is, is, a, is a physical act that signifies a spirit of humility before God and an openness before God for God, I don't know what to do here, but you, you are, you're all powerful. You can figure things out here and may you be glorified whatever the outcome of this situation is. And so one of the reasons we fast is to loosen the bands of wickedness or you might say to free ourselves and others from addictions to sin in some cases. That might be to uh, pornography, it might be to food, it might be to drugs, 
and it may literally be in some cases to demonic harassment, oppression, or possession. And so fasting is an integral part of deliverance ministry. It's also a part of helping people overcome addictions. It's an important part of helping people overcome addictions. And, uh, you know, if you're battling with an addiction, I'd encourage you to seriously consider fasting. Now, as we're going to talk about fasting here, just like a, minute, like a little caveat here, I'm not your doctor. You may be hyperglycemic. You may be diabetic. I don't know what your condition is. Uh, there are different kinds of fasts in, we find in the scripture. Um, you know, there's the 40-day fast of Elijah on uh, Mount Sinai and Jesus in the wilderness where there was no food or water. Now, that's kind of an extreme fast, and I would not recommend that. You're probably not going to survive it. Um, but you may have, for instance, a Daniel fast. Um, we find Daniel fasting in Daniel 1 uh, where he was just eating pulses and lentils and water. And so a, a Daniel fast may be suitable for you if you're worried about your blood sugar levels. And the Bible has, has multiple forms of fasting. In Daniel 10, Daniel is fasting. He's avoiding heavy foods um, for, for three weeks while he's praying and fasting over the situation of his people and why they can't go back to Jerusalem. And so um, there are different kinds of fasts that we find in the Bible. And so what is, it's, it's not meritorious in the eyes of God for you to fast for so many days in a certain way. It doesn't earn you merit with God. But denying yourself something is a way of showing humility before God. And so some people may fast from chocolate, other people may fast from carbs, other people may just go to a diet, other people to a salads, other people may just go to water for a few days. Um, people fast in different ways. And we have to be honest with ourselves, you know, uh, we, we, we need to do fasting in a way that's not going to hurt our health in the long term. Uh, so the first um, uh, way, reason we fast is the disciples fast based on Matthew 17 where Jesus says, well, you know, you, you're not casting out these demons because you're not fasting and praying. And when they ask him why they can't cast out a demon. So I'd encourage you today, if you are dealing with, with what you consider satanic oppression or harassment, or you're dealing with addictions, uh, one of the ways to overcome that is to fast as well as pray. And as you fast, you, you're actually resetting your, your immune system, your, um, what do you call it, in your body? Your, your immune system, yeah, you're, you're, you're resetting it. You do a 72-hour fast, you're resetting your immune system. Your body's able to produce red blood cells in a much more healthy way when you fasted for 72 hours. And so when you fast for the first day, you feel okay. If you fast on the second day, you feel kind of lightheaded and your urine smells because you're detoxing and so forth, drink lots of water. On the third day is when you feel real grumpy and uh, you start dreaming about food, by the time you get to day four, you're not hungry anymore. Amen. If any of you have done it, you'll know this. You can go from day four to about day 10, day 12, and you have no interest whatsoever in food. Your bowels have shut down, you're drinking like a fish because you're, you're detoxing, you're purging your body. Um, the body is burning fats and a lot of the toxins in your body are stored in the fats in your body. And so you're, you're detoxing your body and uh, you can sit next to somebody eating, you know, you know, burger and fries and it has, or pizza, or whatever your favorite food is, let's confess this, yes. Um, uh, but uh, I don't like pizza, it's not good for my heart. I see that, that sticky cheese, you know, and I think in my heart, I think, oh, I don't want that, you know. Um, but it does taste good. Um, so anyway, um, but days like 4 to 12, you feel okay. You just feel weak, like don't go running or go to the gym days 4 through 12, you may collapse. I've done that because you don't have any energy and you're losing a pound a day at least. By the time you get to day 12, you're starting to hallucinate about food. And if you're on a 15 day water fast, I did that one of those last year. Um, by day 15, all you can think of is food. I mean, you are fixated on food. And going beyond 15 days is, is starting to get dangerous for your body. So I wouldn't recommend that. But um, you want to take medical advice before you do anything as extreme as that. But um, when you break your fast, the temptation is to gorge and empty the fridge. That's not what you want to do. You want to take a very light vegetable soup um, or maybe a smoothie and then just let it sit there for 24 hours and then slowly get your bowels used to food again. And you'll notice your stomach will have physically shrunk during those 15 days and you can't stomach more than like a slice of bread and a peach or something. When the, you, your stomach is really small after a 15 day fast. It's literally shrunk during that time. So just some practical tips about fasting there. Then you have the Ezra fast in verse 6. 
is to lift, um, is to break every yoke or to undo the heavy burdens. And uh, the reason we, f- we fast uh, when Ezra, when, when they needed to go back to Israel, and he was leading some people back to Israel, and he had a lot of gold and silver and offerings and, and stuff for the temple, um, gold plate and so forth, the king, offered him, the king offered him an armed cavalry escort. Remember that story? And Ezra, they prayed and fasted for a day and declined the offer and said, Lord, um, the king is offering us an armed escort, but we're, gonna, we're choosing to trust in you. So they prayed and they fasted, and uh, so this is one of the reasons that we pray and fast, is to solve problems that we're facing, inviting the Holy Spirit's aid to lift loads and to overcome barriers that that impede our walk with God. And this fast in the book of Ezra was a one-day fast. It wasn't a three-day fast, it wasn't a seven-day fast, it wasn't a ten-day fast or a forty-day fast, it was a one-day fast. And so um, you may be facing challenges in your life, you may have... Um, um, a difficult task lying ahead of you and I would encourage you before you do that difficult task to spend a day fasting now when you fast you, you create time for prayer don't you yeah like my, like my wife prepares the food in our family um, she's a great cook and um, I've every, I'm not good with my hands every time I go in the kitchen I cut myself <laughs> slice myself boil myself burn myself burn my, you know how it goes yes um, the only thing I haven't done is microwaved myself, but not for lack of trying. Um, things reached a boiling point in our household on this issue when my wife had her wisdom teeth out and um, she was upstairs in bed recovering from general anesthesia and she says, can you make me vegetable soup? And I went, uh-huh, uh, there's, there's vegetables, yeah? Okay, I understand that. So she, she told me what to do to make a vegetable soup because if I'm left to my own devices, I just eat bread and marmite, you know, or muesli and soy milk, you know. That's what I revert to. That's my default diet. I don't, I'm not very adventuresome in the kitchen. And it's hard to cut yourself when you're eating muesli, isn't it? Yeah. So I went downstairs and I was grating happily away, grating the carrot into the bowl, into the, the pot, and it was all boiling down there. And I wasn't paying much attention and I was doing it as fast as I could. And uh, anyway, I felt this stabbing pain in my thumb and I looked down and there was this blood welling up. I'd taken about a third of my nail off with the flesh underneath on the greater. Some of you have done it probably? Yeah. Yes, yeah. And, and the blood was welling up and I looked down into the pot and I couldn't see where my flesh was. And so I thought, well, what do I do? And the blood was like running into the pot. So I thought, well, the Bible says that uh, we become one flesh, yes? Yeah? So this is okay. So <clears throat> I went and got the blender and, and I blended it all up, hoping that the nail and the flesh would be blended as well. I'm not sure if it was. It was probably just some roughage, you know. And uh, <clears throat> went and bandaged up my thumb so that the blood wasn't kind of pouring out of it and then took this um, bowl of Esau's pottage up to my wife who ate it delightedly and said it was absolutely delicious and I must do it again. And then she said, um, why is your thumb looking like that? And so I said, well, you know, uh, we have become one flesh. Uh, um, so, you know, flesh of my flesh and blood of my blood and all the rest of it. So, um, Sorry? Is that after she ate it? Or? That was after she ate it. I didn't tell her. Um, I wanted to test whether she held those truths of Scripture, you know. So, um, anyway, ever, ever since that time, I'm pretty much banned from preparing food in the kitchen other than, you know, a slice of bread and toast, toast for myself in the morning with marmite or peanut butter on it. So, um, anyway, uh, now why was I talking about that? Uh, I go down these rabbit trails on the pulpit. And I think, why am I talking about this? Um, fasting, yes, yeah. I'm not sure why f- this... Oh, yeah, cooking, fasting, yeah. Yeah, that's why I'm talking about this. So, um, if, if you're an average person spends about two hours a day preparing food, eating the food, washing the dishes afterwards, and feeling slightly, like, heavy-headed after the food. Yes? Two hours a day? Ladies, how much time do you spend a day in the kitchen? All day. All day. All right. Yeah, all right, okay. So then, if, if you're an average person today in America, you spend at least, I'd say, two hours a day. If you're a lady, minimum two hours a day on food prep and all the rest of it. If you fast for the day, and you're a busy person, and you say, I don't have time to pray, if you fast for the day, you've suddenly created two hours in the day that you never otherwise would have had. Because you're not doing food prep, and you're not eating, and you're not washing up. So you say, Lord, I'm going to spend the time that I would have spent in the kitchen. I'm going to go to a private closet and I'm going to pray over something. 
okay? And so fasting creates time for prayer in a way that nothing else does, okay? And so um, when we fast, uh, the Ezra fast is we pray that, we, we fast that way because there's a task coming up ahead of us, a major job, and we're asking God to bless us and protect us in that job. To let the oppressed go free. We find that also there in verse 6. Number one of the fruit of fasting, one of the reasons of fasting, is to let the oppressed go free. Uh, you might say this is, uh, we find an example of this in 1 Samuel 7, 6, where Samuel gathers the people together and he basically rebukes them for the fact that they're worshipping foreign gods and they need to get rid of these other gods because they're oppressed by the nations around um, because of their apostasy. And in order to be free of the oppression, they have to get rid of those foreign gods. And so they have a day of fasting with the people there, with the people of Israel in, in 1 Samuel 7 and verse 6. And so one of the reasons we fast, the Samuel fast, is to we can, we can, for spiritual revival, for identifying the, the false gods in our life, for identifying how Satan is oppressing us in our lives um, through those false gods. And many people have those false gods in their lives. Um, somebody may say, well, Conrad, I'd love to be a missionary, but I've got this, you know, sports car collection. I don't want to leave it behind. Well, I have no problem if you have a sports car collection, you know. Nothing wrong with that, I guess. But if it stops you from serving God, then it has become a problem. And, and if you were to ask yourself, if the church were to ask you to go and plant in a church in a dark county here in Maine, to go and plant a house church somewhere, what would hold you back from doing that? And be honest with yourself. It may be you have a job, okay, that's not a false god, um, but um, it may be something else holding you back. It may be, I don't know, the lunch club you go to, it may be the bicycle club you're part of, it may be um, the view you have every morning from your kitchen window. I don't know what it is. You need to be honest with yourself. Are there things in your life that are holding you back from serving God more fully? And when we fast, God brings to remembrance those things that are holding us back from serving him more fully. Then you have the Elijah fast, to break every yoke. You find that there in Isaiah 58 and verse 6. So we're working our way to Isaiah 58 here. What does to break every yoke mean? It means to conquer the emotional and mental problems that would control us and return control of our lives to God. And so we find this, the best example of this is in the story of Elijah in 1 Kings 19, where he runs away from Jezebel who wants to kill him. And uh, Elijah really is suffering from depression. Yes, and he, and he wants to be dead. He says, I, only I am left. Yes, and they're trying, they've killed the prophets, now they're trying to kill me, and I'm running away. And he leaves his servant behind, and he, gives, he leaves his rod behind, like he's giving up his prophetic calling, and he's running down to the Sinai wilderness, basically to crawl up in a hole and just hope the world goes away. And so Elijah was suffering from, uh, you might say, emotional and spiritual exhaustion, probably full-on depression at that point, and uh, he fasts. He fasts for 40 days as he runs into the wilderness. And when God draws near to him, the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord in that story there, he doesn't rebuke Elijah um, for being, feeling depressed or running away from his ministry. Um, the first thing that the angel of the Lord does, it reaches out and, and touches Elijah. And uh, for some people, touch is, well, for all of us, touch is really important. And with the lockdowns, people living on their own have just lost touch with other human beings. And touch is a really important part of our mental health. To have somebody give you a hug is really important. You know, to have someone touch you on the arm, to have someone shake you by the hand, to, uh, is, is really important for our mental and emotional health. And so the angel of the Lord touches Elijah. And the next thing that the angel of the Lord does is it prepares a meal for Elijah. So he gives Elijah space for physical rest, uh, emotional um, healing with a touch and um, provides a meal, takes care of him physically. And so um, fasting, we see in the story of Elijah, is a way that we break every yoke. And so um, there are people who are suffering from mental illness. You may be suffering from anxiety, burnout, depression, and so forth. And one of the ways that we overcome uh, those, those particular mental disorders is not the only way, um, is, is through fasting. And through putting us in ourselves in a place where we can ha where we can rest and receive physical support without condemnation, because sometimes that's all people need. 
Uh, it's often more complex than that, but sometimes people who are going through uh, emotional exhaustion or depression that is burnt out, what they need is rest and a comforting touch. They don't need to be, you know, they, if, if the angel Lord had said to Elijah, well, look, you've got seven days and you've got to get back to your job, you know, that's not going to do Elijah any good because he's dreading that seventh day. The angel of the Lord gives him space to rest, gives him touch, and gives him food. And when Elijah does go back, the angel of the Lord says, when you go back to your town, I want you to anoint Elisha, which means that he'll be the next prophet, which means you're not the beginning and end of the story, Elijah. I have bigger plans for my people than just you, and I will continue my work among my people even when you're gone. So don't think it all rests upon your shoulders. And he says to Elijah, and I want you to appoint Jehu as king, which is, you're suffering under Ahab and Jezebel, but I know what the problems are in Israel, and I'm going to take care of them in my way by appointing a new king. And Israel's under attack from Syria. I want you to go to Syria and anoint a new general there as the new king over there, which is Israel's going to have a change in its foreign relations, maybe no more foreign wars. So as Elijah goes back to his job, God gives him essentially like, you know, this, this is the next chapter of Israel's life and you're not in it, but I'm still in control. So God lets Elijah know that, that um, the story, the world doesn't revolve around you. The world isn't dependent on, doesn't rest on your shoulders. And you may feel that the world rests on your shoulders and you're carrying a lot of responsibilities in your family or in your church, but God is in control and he doesn't need me or you. But fasting is a way, as we see in the story of Elijah, that was how God helped or allowed Elijah to overcome the depression and the fear that he was experiencing. Then you find in verse 7 of Elijah, of Isaiah 58, um, one of the purposes of fasting is to share your bread with the hungry. And uh, this is known as the widow's fast. And the widow's fast means that we care for the poor and meet the basic needs of others in their hour of needs. And so the widow's fast um, might be um, where you go to church and you're thinking about you know, putting an extension on the back of your house or you maybe you're thinking of getting a new washing machine. I don't know what the case may be. And you discover in church that there's somebody in the church or in your community who can't pay their rent this month and facing eviction. And the widow's fast would be to say, well, um, I can wait on what I want to do for myself, and I'm going to use my money to bless you instead. Amen. And so that may literally be with food. You may say, I will go without in order that you may have. Uh, so, for instance, you may say, I will go without, you know, my favorite snack this month in order to help this kid get to summer camp. Okay. I'll, sp I'll spend the money on summer camp for that kid rather than on my favorite snack for myself. There are many, many ways you could apply that principle of the widow's fast. Um, but the widow, she, she gave her last food to Elijah expecting that she was going to die. It was an act of trust in the God of Israel that maybe he would take care of her. Um, she thought she was going to die anyway because, you know, it was her last meal. And, uh, but she took a chance on God and God blessed her incredibly. And so I'd encourage you to think about the widow's fast in your life. The widow's fast is essentially denying yourself something in order that somebody else might be blessed. And so think about how you would apply that in the life of your church and within your own family life. Then you have the Apostle Paul fast, which is in Isaiah 58, is in verse 7, um, where it says, that, or verse 8, then your light shall break forth like the dawn. This is an important fast and to allow God's light to break forth like the dawn. We find this in Acts chapter 9, verse 9. When Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus, he went to Damascus, and when he, when he came to Damascus, he, he prayed and fasted for three days, and he was still blind. And in those three days, you know, he was having to make a decision. Was he going to still persecute the church, or was he going to be an apostle for the church? Was he going to represent Jesus faithfully? And uh, he knew that there, was going to be, there were going to be challenges ahead as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so um, Paul fasted for those three days. At the end of those three days, um, the, the disciple Ananias was instructed by Jesus to go and heal, um, to touch him on the eyes and re restore his sight. And uh, so how do we apply that today? Well, if you're going to preach an evangelistic series, pray and fast for a few days before you do it. You know praying fast for three days. Paul did it for three days before he started his apostolic career. Um, Elijah had a restricted diet before he went and announced three years of drought to Ahab. 
John the Baptist had a restricted diet before he went and engaged in his ministry. Jesus fasted in the wilderness before he engaged in his ministry. And so when, when you're going to be uh, maybe preaching on a Sabbath, if you're invited to te- lead a week of prayer, if you're invited to speak at a youth camp, wherever you're invited to speak, or you're invited to speak in public somewhere, um, pray and fast. And Paul did it for three days, Jesus for 40 days before you engage in that activity. Why? Because it brings you clearer perspective and insight. Uh, it, it allows you to perceive heavenly truth much more clearly. Um, it clears out the, the, the fog from the brain, and your brain is much more sharp. And I can tell you, if you fast for three days, your brain feels really sharp. Your sense of discernment and perception is so much greater than on a normal day. And so Paul, um, Paul prayed and fasted for those three days. And uh, if I do an evangelistic series somewhere or I preach at a camp meeting, I always fast around the, that time because I want, I want to have clearer insight, I want to have clear memory, and I want the truth of the gospel and the beauty of Jesus to shine forth more clearly. So this is an important part of fasting, is that the gospel might go forth more clearly. Our time is moving on, and I know I need to finish pretty soon. So then you have the Daniel fast. Um, this is verse 8, that your health will spring forth. Uh, the classic example of this is called the Daniel fast because Daniel did this in Daniel chapter 1. And it was like, you know, um, who's, who's got the best health diet? Is it the king's food or Daniel or God's diet from Genesis 1 and 2? And so one of the reasons we fast is to have a healthier life or for physical healing. And you can reset your immune system with a 72-hour fast. That's a well-known physiological fact. And so if you are experiencing poor health, uh, for instance, we're coming up, you know, when the fall comes, winter flu season arrives. Okay, it happens every year. We're vitamin D deficient in the northern, northern part of the states. Um, many people suffer with COVID in the northern part of the states because we're vitamin D deficient. And so as, as we approach the flu season, it may be worth your while um, fasting for a couple of days, as did Daniel, to reset your immune system before the flu season arrives. It improves your health. It improves your ability to resilient, your body's resilience against um, the, the diseases that are out there. That then the John the Baptist fasts in verse 8. It says that um, your righteousness shall go before you, there in verse 8 of Isaiah 58. Uh, this is very similar to the Paul fast. It's essentially that your, your testimony, that your witness for God will be enhanced before others and it will shine before others. And so John the Baptist, he had a very restricted diet before he enters into his ministry. And we've already mentioned Jesus had the same and so did Elijah. And then we have the Esther fast. This is one that is often uh, used among Christians. Uh, Isaiah 58 and verse 8 says that the glory of the Lord will protect us from the evil one. And so we fast in order that God might protect his people. And the classic example in scripture is Esther. When she was, wanted to go into the king, she asked the Jews of Shushan to pray and fast for how many days? Three days. And then she was going to go into the king. And if I live, I live. And if I perish... I perish. And so they prayed and fasted for three days before that meeting. And I will tell you this, um, for God's protection, um, time and again in mission work, when there is a crisis in the field, when we get threats from jihadis, which happens quite a lot, we pray and fast for a few days. And we put the matter in God's hands. It would be easy to turn to governments. You know, if, when I was with ADRA in Somalia, ADRA guys travel around with, with technicals, with heavy machine guns and Kalashnikovs and guards because the, the people that want to kidnap you and kill you in parts of Somalia. But in mission work, we, we find that praying and fasting is the most effective way of asking for God's protection. And so I'd encourage you, um, before, if you sense that somebody wants to attack you or the church, start praying and fasting for God to intervene. And God intervenes in miraculous ways. We may see that God can do A, B, and C. Those are the human solutions. But God can do A through Z, not just A, B, and C. And he can intervene in ways that not just protect you, but that bring glory to the community and that the whole community sees that this is God at work. So that's the Esther fast. And, um, okay, there are some physical benefits to fasting. Um, moving on to some other uh, aspects of fasting here. We overcome food addictions with fasting. We rest our stomachs and our immune systems. We give our digestive systems a rest. We lower our cholesterol and our blood pressure. We relieve arthritis. We lose weight and we help our bodies fight cancer. 
and it also contributes to clarity of thought and mental health improvements. And I did a 15-day fast last year, and I did it, I timed it because it wasn't because I was, um, had a, a series going on, it's because I had my annual medical on a certain date. And uh, my doctor sends me this angry letter every year that says, your blood sugars are like this, and so forth and so forth and so forth. So I thought, well, I'm going to show her this year. So I did a 15-day fast and dragged myself into the, into the, into the clinic. Uh, you know, uh, just like you know, Jonathan, you know, it says he took the, 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 the honey and his eyes lit up. Like my eyes were dark at that moment. And I walked in there, and um, I kind of sat down gently in the chair, because you're kind of weak after 15 days, and I was just dreaming of that meal. And she took my blood pressure, it was like, I don't know, 95 over 60. And, and it was remarkable weight loss. My, blood, my triglycerides were right where they need to be. And uh, my blood pressure was, was low, and my heartbeat was really slow. And she said, man, this is a remarkable improvement, Mr. Vine. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I've got a medical due in two weeks again, so I may have to do something again for, in anticipation of that. So um, anyway, fasting improves your health. That's the bottom line. It has many health benefits for you. Um, Ministry of Healing uh, talks about uh, fasting, their prayer and fasting. Page 106, she says, we had to feed the hungry, um, clothe the naked and comfort the suffering and the afflicted. Uh, let me just see. Da, 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 da. Okay, through, through his human agencies, he desires to be a comforter, such as the world knows not. And then she talks about de demonization in particular. She says, to those who are victims of demonic possession, they should entreat those who have religious experience and have faith in the promises of God to plead with a mighty deliverer on their behalf. It will be a close conflict. Satan will reinforce his evil angels who have controlled those people. But if the saints of God with deep humility fast and pray, their prayers will prevail. Jesus will commission holy angels to resist Satan and his Satan will be driven back and his power broken from the afflicted persons. So uh, prayer and fasting we find in the, in the spirit of prophecy is recommended or counseled for us just as we see in Matthew 17, particularly in the context of fighting demonic, and uh, Satan, demonic harassment or satanic attack. And I'm kind of closely watching our time. We have six more minutes. So this is a chart of worldviews. And uh, prayer and fasting, it's important to remember that the worldview we bring it affects how we understand fasting. So there are three levels. You've got the divine up here, the unseen world, and you have the human world down here, the human, the empirical, and here you have the middle. So in the divine and the unseen in a world, this is the organic or the personal column, and this is the mechanical or the impersonal. We have a personal God and Satan. And in the unseen, the mechanical and personal, we have karma, fate, destiny, Brahman, cosmic forces, and the stars. Then in the middle, in the organic personal, we have healers, prophets, demons, spirits, ghosts, and angels. And in the mechanical and personal in the middle, we have magic, astrology, tarot cards, charms, amulets, dreams, visions, the Bible, and sacred texts. And then in the empirical, human down here, we have social sciences, human relations, and the animal kingdom. And over here, you have natural sciences, physical sciences, and the mechanical sciences. So uh, if that's kind of like uh, the, the, key, the key components of where you are in your worldview, um, the atheist, the agnostic worldview, only focuses on this bit down here. That's where atheists live, down here. They live in the human and the empirical. The social sciences, the natural sciences, physical and mechanical sciences, the animal kingdom, and the human kingdom. That's where the atheist lives. And uh, that's where they live. Now, the deist, that's a deist is someone who believes in God. You see up here in bold. A deist believes in a personal God, and they believe in the human and the empirical. But a deist um, doesn't actually believe that God has much interest in human activity down here. The God is like the watchmaker who made it the universe and wound it up. And now he's a distant watchmaker. He's not really taking much care in our world. Many of the founders of the U.S. Republic were deists. They were not theists. They were deists. And so um, some Christians are functional deists. That means they, they believe in the empirical down here and they believe in God, but there's not much happening in the middle here. There's no real connection with God in the middle. Why would I pray God doesn't answer my prayers? Bible reading has drives me. I don't get anything from it. I don't really go to church much because, well, you know, the saints are troublesome and I don't get much from it myself. And so um, Christians who are, there are many Christians who are functional deists, which means they believe in down here. They believe theoretically that this exists, but they can't tell you the last time they experienced God's grace. 
and they have a dry devotional life, if at all, and they're not aware of their guardian angel. And um, so, a magical worldview, the people believe in this down here, and they believe in this up here, and they may even believe in God, but it's mostly this column here, magical worldview. And with a magical worldview for a Christian, uh, how would that be applied? A magical worldview says that um, you know, if, if I put a dollar into a vending machine, out will come out a certain bar of chocolate. Okay? And if I press, you know, if I put a, you know, four quarters into a vending machine and press A1, a Snickers bar is going to come out every time. That's a magical worldview. I do something and there's a guaranteed response. And we find this particularly among animists, but we also find it among Christians who believe that if I pray and fast for three days, God is required to give me a certain response. That's a, 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 a magical worldview. It's no different to animists, that if I do this, God is obligated to do that. And that is not something we find in Scripture because God is sovereign and we can't tame him. You know, we talk about uh, Satan being the lion of the tribe, uh, Satan being the roaring lion seeking we may devour, but Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Juba. Judah. He's not a tame pussycat in Scripture. He is a lion on our side. Uh, fighting the lion that is against us. So the, the theistic worldview, or more the biblical worldview, accepts there's the bottom here, this is where we are called to live, in the, in the human and the empirical, and we believe in this, we know this is true and real, but we have an active middle here, which means we have the Bible and dreams and visions and prayer and healers and prophets and demons and ghosts and angels. We believe in all of this. The only thing we don't believe in is this. And, uh, but we focus on this dimension here. And our, our, our hunger in life is to know God and to be known by God and to experience God for ourselves. And therefore, this part of our life becomes the most important. We're not so worried about the me mechanical and the m material. Like, you know, what car I drive is not as important as my connection with my Heavenly Father. And prayer and fasting are right here in the middle here this is one of the means by which we experience the presence of God in our lives. So I would encourage you to think seriously about fasting. Um, if you're thinking about doing it and you have a, a medical problem, and there are many medical problems that could impinge upon fasting, really do check with your physician and ask what would be reasonable for you. Um, it is not a meritorious activity. We don't earn brownie points with God. It is simply a means of humbling ourselves before our Heavenly Father and saying there is a problem it could be multiple problems. There is a problem, um, but you are the healer, and for you all things are possible. So I'm going to humble myself before you and wait on you to see that you are good so that you have space in my life to act. And when you act, I will know that it's you, and I'll give you the honor and the glory. And we apply that in our personal lives, and we apply it in the life of our church and of our conference and our worldwide church. So I'd encourage you to be not just men and women of prayer, but men and women who fast, and who take this seriously, because Jesus assumes that his followers will be people who fast. Okay? So, um, we have one minute left, so we don't have time for questions, I'm sorry. But I'll be around, so I hope this has been a blessing for you. Um, remember the Sabbath, make the Sabbath a delight. Plan for it, make it a delight, and uh, have it as the crowning jewel of your spiritual life. And be men and women of prayer and fasting, and see what God can do in your life for you. So let's bow our heads and we will close with prayer. Our oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of being able to gather here this morning. We thank you for the blessings of life and health. We thank you for the freedoms we yet enjoy in this nation to gather here today. And Father, I ask that in our walk with you, whether it's celebrating the Sabbath and experiencing you personally then, whether it's day by day in prayer and in fasting, we humbly ask that you will continue to shape us and to change us and so that day by day there is less of us and more of Jesus. This is our prayer in his holy name. Amen. So we now have like a five-minute break.